Hi, I'm Karen with the Gaithersburg Community Museum and welcome to the first of many programs that the city of Gaithersburg is doing to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the um, 19th? of the 19th amendment. <laughs> um, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce to you Susan Philpot. Susan is a park ranger at the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument. Yes. Susan's been doing a lot of research, not only um, on suffrage in general, but she's also been looking at what is happening here in Maryland. And so we've asked her to come and talk about, I know you'll be hearing a lot about suffrage nationally, but it's nice to know it was kind of happening in our backyard. Susan, welcome. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, uh, as Karen mentioned, I am Susan Philpott. I'm a park ranger at the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument. I am also a Gaithersburg resident. So uh, I'm actually live right down the street from, um, from the Gaithersburg Community Museum. Um, and, um, and so that is part of the reason that I got really interested in not just knowing what was going on nationally in the fight for uh, women's right to vote and the ongoing struggle for women's equality, but also what was happening right here in Gaithersburg uh, and in Maryland. Um, so together we're going to take a look at some highlights of the women's suffrage movement and especially at the role Maryland has played in the fight for women's equality. So this is a photo of the Hall of Portraits in the Belmont Paul Museum. Um, so if when, when we're able to visit again, you can come see these exhibits. Uh, here uh, you see um, portraits of women of the National Women's Party. So our museum is in the headquarters of the National Women's Party, which was founded by Alice Paul. And the marble bust that you see in the foreground is Alice Paul, the founder. Um, the NWP was one of two main national groups in the 20th century of the suffrage movement. Um, it was the smaller and more confrontational of the two. Uh, the other was the National American Women's Suffrage Association, NASA, which starting in 1915 was led by Carrie Chapman Catt. Um, so the women you see in these uh, exhibits, these are the troublemakers. Um, you'll also see a bust there uh, farther away of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She's the one who organized the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York in July of 1848. And often we mark Seneca Falls as the beginning of the fight for women's right to vote. Um, although as we will see, it wasn't the first time women demanded to be enfranchised. And this photo shows the other side of the Hall of Portraits. Um, and the bus that you see in the foreground shows Susan B. Anthony. If people know one name in the fight for women's rights, they probably know Susan B. Anthony. Um, on the farther pedestal, you see a bust of, that's Alva Vanderbilt Belmont. She's the Belmont of the Belmont Hall. She was the first president of the NWP and also the main benefactor. So it doesn't just take uh, courage and conviction to win social change, you need the cash too. And if you don't recognize anybody else you've seen pictured, um, you would not be alone. Um, most of the time, the only name people really know is Susan B. Anthony, um, and they don't know much else about the seven decade fight for women's political freedom. Uh, your history book might just have told you that in 1920, women were granted the right to vote but no one gave women the vote. They fought for it and they won it. And uh, in the words of Clara Barton, who became a Ma Marylander later in her life and who among other things was a committed suffragist. She said, I believe I must've been born believing um, in the rights of women to all the privileges and positions um, which justice accord her in common with other humans, perfectly equal rights human rights. And then when she talked about, you know, that she was asking for the right to vote, she said, of whom should I ask this privilege? Who possesses the right to confer it? Who had a greater right than the woman herself? Was it a man? 
And if so, where did he get it? So this idea that um, women didn't, weren't given anything, they claimed what was rightfully theirs. And many women believe that. Um, you might have heard, you heard me refer to um, to Clara Barton as a suffragist. Just a word about term, quick word about that term. Um, one thing you might have heard is that women who fought for the vote were called suffragettes. Um, in the U.S., that term was considered demeaning, a form of ridicule. Um, we will meet a suffragette in a bit, but American women preferred the term suffragist. And in the 20th century, they actually called themselves feminists as well. Um, so Marilyn can claim maybe the first suffragist. Um, in 1648, Margaret Brent, who was a lawyer and executor of Governor Calvert's estate, petitioned the Maryland General Assembly for the vote. This was when Maryland was still a British colony. She was a landowner, she argued, and a prominent leader. And she was due the same rights as male Marylanders. Um, but it didn't work. The assembly rejected her demand. Uh, Margaret Brent is one story that we know of, of women demanding their rights. But the truth is, wherever there are women, you can be sure that you can find them calling out injustice when they are treated unfairly, if you look for their stories. So that Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, when there's the first call for women's right to vote, suffrage is another word for the right to vote, um, kicked off a series of women's rights conventions around the Northeast. Two prominent women's rights advocates were born in Maryland, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. The women's rights and abolitionist movements were connected, uh, the leaders in each also supporting the goals of the other. There was no significant women's rights activity in Maryland, however, um, in part maybe due to that connection to the abolitionist movement um, and many Southern slaveholding states, uh, there was no work for women's rights uh, before the Civil War. And of course, Douglas and Tubman had to flee Maryland to escape their enslavement. But one important African-American suffragist who was from Maryland is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She was a poet, a lecturer, a novelist, an essayist. Uh, she was the first African-American woman to publish a short story. Um, and she was an abolitionist and suffragist. She left Baltimore when she was 26, where she had been born. Um, to, she went to work in Ohio. And then soon after that, Maryland passed a law that um, free African Americans who had left the state couldn't return, so she couldn't come back to Maryland. She eventually settled in Philadelphia and was active in reformer circles. Uh, and at a National Women's Rights Convention in New York in 1866, um, after the Civil War, she spoke uh, and addressed the growing racial tension that was in the equality movement. Um, and they were really at odds about whose rights were they supposed to be talking about? Uh, was it black men's rights? Was it white women's rights? And of course, black women are, are getting um, pulled in both directions in that. Um, and in her famous speech she gave, she said, you white women speak of rights. I speak of wrongs, of the wrongs that need to be corrected. And uh, the, that speech, uh, is known as the, we are all bound up together speech, her point that we are all connected to each other and that if we want equality, we need it from everyone. The year after Frances Harper's speech in New York in 1867, Lavinia Dundor organized the Maryland Equal Rights Society, which was an interracial group in Maryland that was fighting for voting rights and equality for African-Americans and women. And the society was very active and even had a very well in, uh, attended convention in 1872 with several national suffrage activists uh, attending, delivering speeches or sending love letters of support. And then by 1874, the Maryland Equal Rights Society had disbanded. So there was a surge of activity that fell 
apart right around the same time that the reconstruction was falling apart. Um, this image that you see on the screen is a screenshot of a great resource if you want to find out more about um, Maryland women's fight for the vote. It's from the Maryland Historical Trust. It's a story map. Um, Casey Roan, who's now a historic preservation specialist at the Montgomery County Planning Department, uh, has done fantastic work on covering the history of Maryland women in the suffrage movement. Um, and I relied a lot on her work for much of this presentation. If you Google Maryland and the 19th Amendment, her work will probably pop up. So check that out. So in the 20th century, there were at least three major women's suffrage organizations active here in Maryland that I could find. Um, the Maryland State Suffrage Association, the Just Government League of Maryland, and the Equal Suffrage League. And, and they all organized events and held meetings throughout the state to fight for women's right to vote. And that was really the case all over the country. Although there was a national organization, much of the fight for suffrage took place in local groups across the country. Women who organized, lobbied, petitioned, and made plans in their parlors among their neighbors. Um, the Montgomery County branch of the Just Government League was founded in, on July 25th, 1912 in Barnesville. Um, and I found at least one reference to a meeting in Gaithersburg at the home of Mrs. Frank Trezari. And the Gaithersburg district chairman in 1912 was Miss M.F. Hinckley, if anybody knows any, um, has any connection to those families. Often these smaller organizations would become chapters of or affiliates of the state suffrage organization and the national organization as well. And by 1890, that, that division in the suffrage movement was beginning to become somewhat mended, uh, particularly as that first generation of suffrage leaders were aging and dying. Um, so in an uh, attempt to keep things going, the next generation of women suffragists came back together. They formed a new uh, united organization. That's the National American Woman Suffrage Association. That's why it has kind of an awkward name, NASA. Um, and that uh, NASA became the major coordinator of state and local campaigns. So a Maryland suffragist sent delegates to annual NASA uh, conventions. And then in 1906, they brought the national convention to Maryland, to Baltimore. Um, it was held at the Lyric Theater. And Susan B. Anthony delivered her final public speech there. She encouraged the younger suffragists to continue the fight. And she declared to them failure is impossible. And then seven years later, on November 19th, 1913, there was another suffrage gathering at the Lyric with a new kind of suffrage leader. Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters led a militant suffrage movement in England. Now, just like Susan B. Anthony and Francis Harper, they could give impassioned moving speeches, but they didn't think anything was going to change that way. Their slogan was deeds, not words. And some of those deeds were things like throwing rocks, breaking windows, slapping policemen, setting buildings on fire, other acts of vandalism. And so for all these kinds of deeds, as you can imagine, they got arrested. They went to jail and in prison, they went on hunger strikes and they were violently force fed. Um, and these British women are the ones who kind of claimed that name of suffragette. So when you say suffragette, uh, to be appropriate, you are referencing the, the small militant band led by the Pankhurst. Uh, in the picture here, you see one of Emmeline Pankhurst's many arrests. And that picture is juxtaposed with a um, photo of her looking very prim and proper sitting on a chair. Um, and that um, more uh, refined, respectable woman is the one who made the appearance in Baltimore. Um, she had traveled to on speaking tours to the US many times when she came in 1913. Um, she was detained at Ellis Island and the charge was moral turpitude. <laughs> 
uh, for her behavior. And it took intervention by Woodrow Wilson, the president, to get her uh, released from Ellis Island. And then she came to Baltimore and gave a speech. Um, and despite her reputation, the Baltimore Sun reported that her speech was very peaceful and dignified. Although a few days earlier in Hartford, she'd given a speech where she declared, give me liberty or give me death. But there was no report of that same kind of fiery rhetoric in Maryland. Uh, as far as I can tell, there was also no mention that she was delivering her speech on the 50th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, no matter how symbolic that was. The Baltimore Sun reporter did note, though, how many young women there were in the audience. And the group gathered was already very much aware of Emmeline Pankhurst's young American protege, Alice Paul. Alice became a suffragette when she was in graduate school in England. Uh, the US papers carried accounts of her arrests and forced feedings. So uh, she became kind of a celebrity here in the US. When Alice returned to the US, she made her mark on the national scene by organizing a suffrage procession down Pennsylvania Avenue on March 3rd, 1913, the day before Woodrow Wilson's presidential inauguration. And the purpose of that demonstration was to demand that the new president support a federal constitutional amendment enfranchising women. So up to this point, uh, the suffrage movement had concentrated on winning women the vote um, at the state level. And they'd had some successes. By 1913, women could vote on the same terms as men in nine Western states. And in others, women had won partial suffrage, maybe in local or school elections. And that was true in Maryland too. Uh, women could vote in bond elections in Annapolis starting in 1900, although not for any elected officials. And in the town of Still Pond in Kent County, um, women tax payers could vote in municipal elections starting in 1908. But there were several measures to enfranchise women statewide and those were voted down time and again in the Maryland legislature. And Alice Paul and this new young generation of suffragists were fed up with this piecemeal approach. So they wanted to win the vote for women across the country. And the way to do that, they believed, was by amending the US Constitution. So they had this big procession um, down the inaugural route on Pennsylvania Avenue. And there was a contingent, a delegation of Maryland women who marched. Um, they rode a special train from Baltimore down to DC that was called the Suffrage Special. Um, and those participants in the parade included at about 15 to 20 from Montgomery County. Because of its proximity to Washington, D.C., often suffrage activists would stop in Maryland on their way to the nation's capital. And for that 1913 suffrage procession, there was a group of suffrage pilgrims, they called themselves, led by Rosalie Jones. They hiked from New York to DC through February um, to make it in time for the parade. And so once they hit Maryland, they uh, were welcomed at several stops throughout Maryland. Um, in the picture here, you can see on the left, a photograph of the bus carrying those suffrage hikers in the procession being swarmed by the onlookers. That's what happened during the procession. The people didn't stay on the sidewalks. They um, took over Pennsylvania Avenue and women ended up getting grabbed and spit on and trampled. A uh, hundred people had to go to the hospital. It became a huge melee, which you might think was a disaster, but as it turned out, the publicity kept women's suffrage in the headline for weeks. So public relations success. And a few months after the procession, a delegation of suffragists carrying petitions to Congress also came through Maryland. They met in a ball field in Hyattsville on their way in. But Maryland didn't just welcome people from out of state, they organized their own events too. Maryland suffragists made sure that they were visible throughout the state for years and years, especially at important community events. They would set up booths at county fairs. They drove cars decorated with suffrage banners and flowers in local parades. Um, they even entered a suffrage boat in a regatta 
in Annapolis. And women kept doing that hiking to prove that, you know, they were strong and capable and deserved to participate in their government. They hiked all through Western Maryland under the leadership of a woman who called herself General, General uh, Edna Latimer. And then Latimer also campaigned with this woman that you see here who was Lola Trax. Um, and she went on a pilgrimage around the state in a horse-drawn covered wagon called a prairie schooner. And you can see it's adorned with flags and boats for women. And so then at, at each town that they come to or the community will come out and they can uh, tell people about the wagon and say, votes for women. I found out about a lot of these events from the Maryland Suffrage News. So the Just Government League published a weekly newspaper that had news all about uh, suffrage activities both in the state and around the country. It was published by uh, under the leadership of Edith Houghton Hooker, who you see pictured here. And um, by the way, Edith's sister Catherine was also a suffragist and she was the mother of actress Catherine Hepburn. Um, you can find some uh, editions of the Maryland Suffrage News digitized at the Library of Congress. Um, so you can check out some of those stories as well. As well. Um, the Just Government League also opened a coffee room and restaurant in DC near the headquarters of Alice Paul's new suffrage organization, the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. And Alice Paul broke away from NASA pretty early. She had kind of, she kind of butted heads with the older leaders there. They thought she uh, was this young upstart who didn't know her place and was a little too confrontational, didn't know how to go about things. So Alice Paul broke away. Um, uh, the Congressional Union eventually became the National Women's Party in 1916. Um, and Edith Hooker and the Just Government League were one of the early groups to associate with the National Women's Party. Here you've got a picture of them in 1914 at the Annapolis State House. You see them wearing what became the colors of the National Women's Party, the tri-colored sash of purple, white, and gold. Um, so uh, one of the things that the Just Government League did was open a restaurant near the NWP headquarters. It was a Maryland-run restaurant, but it was in DC. And at the restaurant, Edith Hooker and the other Maryland suffragists proclaimed that the delicious meals they served demonstrated conclusively that suffragists can cook. So we can do all our womanly things and we can vote too. The National Women's Party became infamous for their willingness to use increasingly confrontational tactics in the fight for that constitutional amendment, particularly in trying to win Woodrow Wilson's support. They believed he was the key to getting this amendment through Congress. Now in Britain, Alice Paul had been willing to engage in property damage and demonstrations, but she didn't do anything like that in uh, the US campaign. Uh, but in January 1917, they began a campaign that was considered nearly as scandalous. They began to picket the White House. Starting in January 1917, they showed up at the White House gates, took up positions with banners, and stood there all day. They didn't say anything. They just held up banners that often quoted Woodrow Wilson, used his own words against him. Mr. President, you say... Uh, liberty is the fundamental demand of the human spirit. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And people like the leadership of NASA, Carrie Chapman Cat, were just appalled. You know, respectable women do not stand on street corners. You are making us look ridiculous. Um, in this picture, you see some Maryland women. This is Maryland Day. Uh, all these protesters are from Maryland. So there were Maryland women who were willing to be so scandalous and picket the White House. Beginning in the summer of 1917, once the US entered World War I, the picketers began to get arrested. It became, you know, not just unladylike, but unpatriotic, un-American to protest a president during a war. Um, and so they kept picketing, kept getting arrested. And like in Britain, many of them went to jail. And while they were in jail, just like in Britain, they went on hunger strikes and they were force fed, many of them. And including some women from Maryland, 
Um, Lucy Branham was one of uh, the prominent Marylanders who was a picketer who got arrested several times, spent uh, many terms both in the Occoquan workhouse and in the district jail. Um, and then she also participated in the prison special, which was a 1919 nationwide tour by rail of women who had been imprisoned. Uh, they wore replicas of their prison dresses to highlight the oppression of women. And you might also notice that on my uniform here, I have a jail door pin. This was something that the National Women's Party would award to everyone who had gone to prison. So they wore it not as a badge of honor. They weren't ashamed. They weren't concerned about being respectable. Now, although that early equal rights society in Maryland was integrated, by the 20th century, white suffragists in Maryland usually excluded African-American women from participating in their organizations. And although NASA and the NWP all, both allowed black members, all the leadership was white. You probably noticed in that hallway, the hall of portrait, every face you saw there was white. Um, they didn't really, weren't particularly welcoming to women of color in their organizations. Um, so as in many parts of the country, black women in Maryland formed their own organizations and they worked for many things um, for civil and social uplifts for their complete communities, including women's right to vote. So uh, Augusta Chis, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, Chiselle, um, formed the Progressive Women's Suffrage Club in Baltimore in 1915 to work for the enfranchisement of all women in the state. Um, and in November, 2019, two Girl Scout troops who had researched uh, Augusta Chassel and her good friend and neighbor, Margaret Hawkins, um, worked to get this uh, National Votes for Women Trail marker installed at the home of Chassel and Hawkins. Um, they participated in the unveiling ceremony. Um, and this is on Druid Hill in Baltimore. So after years and years of agitation, finally in June of 1919, there is a victory. That federal amendment and franchising women passed through Congress. And the amendment reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. But getting it through Congress was not the, that was just the first step. Now the battle goes out to the states because to get an amendment to the constitution, you have to get it ratified by three quarters of the states. And that was 36 in 1919. Um, and Maryland suffragists really hoped that their state was gonna become one of those 36, but it was not to be. On February 24th, 1920, Maryland became the fifth state to reject ratification of the 19th amendment. And Maryland suffragists really felt like they were railroaded uh, by the leadership in the legislature. They thought that they were being deliberately given wrong information about when the hearings on the amendment would be held. So as it turned out, there were no pro-suffrage speakers available to advocate for ratification, but the anti-suffragists were there um, and their argument won the day. Now, by the time the General Assembly had voted down ratification, the Maryland suffragists had gotten the word and they all gathered at the, um, gathered at the State House. And this is a quote from the Maryland Suffrage News. They gathered, quote, with colors flying and playing martial airs. And they marched two by two around the Capitol. So they were gonna have to rely on other states to ratify the amendment to win the vote. And that finally happened 100 years ago this month, when in August of 1920, Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the amendment. It officially became part of the US Constitution uh, on August 26th, 1920. So that is the official 100th anniversary. Um, Maryland did finally ratify the amendment but not until March 25th, 1958. Um, or I'm sorry, March 29th, 1941, but they didn't make it official until March 25th, 1958, even after they had passed it. 
But as the state had already discovered, women's suffrage was the law in Maryland, even if they didn't ratify the amendment. And they tried to challenge that. Shortly after the 19th Amendment was ratified in August 1920, Judge Oscar Lesser sued the state of Maryland to remove the names of two Baltimore women from the list of registered voters. His position was that the Maryland Constitution granted voting rights only to men. And Maryland hadn't ratified the 19th Amendment, so women can't vote here. In January 1922, so two years after the ratification, the United States Supreme Court heard the case. Um, there were several arguments put forth by the court, and one of them was that the character of the proposed amendment excluded it from being added to the Constitution, but because voting eligibility is determined by the states. Um, so if Lesser had prevailed, that could have meant that the federal government couldn't make any regulations at all regarding voting, including throwing out the 15th Amendment, which was the one that prohibited uh, discrimination in voting based on race. But in a unanimous decision issued February 27th, 1922, the Supreme Court ruled against Lesser and confirmed the constitutionality of the 19th Amendment and basically of the 15th Amendment too. They so said that's been accepted as law for over 50 years, the 19th Amendment um, was valid as well. And they shot down the rest of Lesser's arguments also. So because of that, maybe in a backhanded way in Maryland, we can be proud of that. Because of that case, the Supreme Court affirmed that, um, that the federal government could have a hand in voting and that in a way protected women's right to vote. So, like I said, maybe in your history books, you saw a picture of Susan B. Anthony and you heard that women were given the right to vote. But when you don't know how it happened, you might get the impression that, you know, things just get better over time. Eventually, equality shows up. Right? It gets better, we figure it out. So far, at least, that has never been the way things happen. Things change because people work at it. Like those women in Maryland, they make plans in their living rooms. They network with their friends. They show up over and over and over and over again to bring attention to the issue. They lobby their politicians, even if they get turned away and ridiculed over and over and over again. In the case of women fighting for the vote, they fought for 72 years before finally, finally winning the battle. So I hope that when you see things that need to change, that you might get a little inspiration from all those troublemaker suffragists in Maryland and all around the country. August 26th now is celebrated as Women's Equality Day. But of course, August 26th was not the day that women won equality. It's just the day they won the vote. The vote was not the end. The vote is just the beginning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Susan, that was fascinating. I learned so much. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, so we just have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Um, talked a bit about the early, uh, the early suffragists and, um, and their connection with the abolitionists. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering about the later suffragists and their connection with the prohibitionists. Yeah, so that's a great question. And you know, I did not look into uh, any temperance movements in Maryland. That would be a good place to continue the research if you if I, I've whetted your appetite of curiosity and you wanna keep looking. Um, so it is true that one of the ways that women got very involved politically was uh, in, involved in the fight for temperance, for making alcohol illegal. And they considered that a women's rights issue, that basically their argument was that men um, 
went to the saloons, drank up all their paychecks, came home and abused their families, um, and that women were powerless in this situation. They just had to endure the abuse. And so the answer to that was to get rid of alcohol. And they were really effective um, in their political action at a time when they didn't have the vote. Um, so they found all kinds of ways to get things done without having the power of the ballot. But eventually, by the 20th century, what was happening is that that then brought the liquor interests and liquor producers to the side of the anti-suffragists and brought all their money and all their influence against women's suffrage. So women's suffragists figured out that maybe it was in their best interest to um, to disassociate themselves from the temperance movement, even though there were women who had worked in both things to, to not associate that. We don't have anything to do with temperance. Um, we're just, we just want the vote. Um, it is interesting though, that the United States was willing to pass a constitutional amendment for prohibition before the constitutional amendment for women's right to vote. So by the time the 19th amendment passed through Congress, the 18th Amendment outlawing alcohol had already passed, so that issue had become moot. Hmm. Well, that brings actually the next question is, um, you talked about the, the men and, and the alcohol were anti-suffrage, but what about anti-suffrage women, women who didn't think women should vote? Yeah, so isn't that interesting, right? That there are women who are saying basically, that women shouldn't vote, that that's the, not the appropriate place for women, that we have separate spheres. The political sphere is ugly and dirty. Women don't want to get involved in politics. Women's place is the home. Um, but to make that argument, they had to enter the political sphere. Uh, so they had to move into the public square to make the argument that women, um, shouldn't vote. Um, uh, one funny story is that in Massachusetts, they had a ballot initiative to ask if, if women should be able to vote. And for that one uh, election, women were allowed to vote on that issue. And the Massachusetts anti-suffragists said, we can't vote to say we, can, we shouldn't vote. So you should count every woman who doesn't vote as a no vote. <laughs> It got defeated without that anyway. <laughs> it gives you a sense of, of uh, the messy waters they were in. But it's, the, it's similar arguments that you hear um, about many different things having to do with change. This concern that you are upsetting the proper order of things, that there is something immoral and improper and frightening and scary about this huge change. I mean, it, it was a huge change. That was the largest expansion of the franchise in US history. Half, half of the populations who had not been franchise, enfranchised now have the vote. So that was a huge change. Um, and no one knew what it was gonna mean when women started voting. Um. And then I have, uh, how would you suggest modern day troublemakers go about lobbying their local leaders? That is a great question. And I, I love that you want to be a troublemaker in the, in the words of, of, of one of my heroes, John Lewis exhorted everyone to say, get in trouble, but get in good trouble. Find ways to get attention, um, to keep people talking. That is one thing that the suffragists particularly, I have to say Alice Paul and the National Women's Party were very good at. Keep the issue in the headlines, keep people talking about it. And she would often, you know, if it seemed like something like the war or something was taking over the headlines, she'd ratchet it up a little bit. Um, but she was careful to stay on message. And one thing that they were, um, that they had maybe the luxury of is they had a thing that they were fighting for. This constitutional amendment, that's the thing we're fighting for. We want this thing passed. Here it is, do this. Um, so that might be part of the key to success as well is 
to, to be specific about what it is you want, to have something really tangible that you're saying, this is the action that we want. We know there's uh, a systemic injustice, but here is one thing that we're fighting for this time. One thing I think that they made a mistake on was their thinking that they didn't have to be concerned with issues of things like race, that somehow race and sex were two different issues that as long as black women were being um, treated the same way as white as black men, then that was a race issue, not a sex issue. That wasn't their issue. And that is a mistake as uh, in my opinion that uh, as Francis Walker said, we are all bound up together. Everyone's, in, uh, and as Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So in, your, in the work of being specific, don't be exclusive. When we're talking about equality, we have to talk about equality for all. Well, that's a great, great place to end <laughs> today. Uh, you can't get a better ending line than that. So I wanna thank you so much for doing this. It's been a fascinating talk. And I wanna tell everybody out there, the city has a, a huge lineup. So for the next couple of months, we're all about um, suffrage and the right to vote. And so here at the museum, we have um, two more evening uh, programs. We're going to have a visit from Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, who you heard is one of the early uh, founders of the suffrage movement as uh, portrayed by um, Dr. Grube, and then, and she's going to be in September. In October, um, Mary Church Terrell will be visiting us. Actually, she will be interviewed by a local student talking about her life um, and, and the other uh, Black women who um, were part of the suffrage movement. So uh, I think those will be really exciting for all ages. And then we're going to have uh, two story times, September and October, so look for those. Um, one uh, about Alice Paul and uh, the president, Woodrow Wilson, and the other about two women who traveled the country um, fighting for suffrage with their typewriter and their little black cat. So. Yeah, so kind of like Lola tracks going around in the prairie schooner, they went around in a car with a cat. So that they, I think I'm really that's a great story. <laughs> So the authors will be reading those stories, which will make it even better. And then um, we will have an exhibit at the Activity Center. It will also be online called Why We Vote. It's a collaboration with the uh, Women's Caucus uh, for Art, the DC chapter. And, and I hope all of you will take some time and try and see that work by women artists about why we vote and, um, and really think about it. And then they have they will have a panel uh, in on October 4th to talk about that theme. And then the next uh, program coming up, actually um, the Benjamin Gaither Center will have a program streaming on their Facebook page on Tuesday, starting at one with author Patricia Cuff talking about Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. So we hope to see you at all of these really fascinating events. And until next time, Bye. Bye again, Susan, and thanks so much for doing this. Thank you for having me.